as entrepreneurs, we all want to make a major difference. And one of the things that all of us have as we communicate with our marketplace, our clients, our prospective clients, our uh, really strategic partners, our influencers, we have one thing in common. Every single one of us has a website. And between you and me, most of us aren't using it as effectively as we'd like. And I've got a fellow entrepreneur with us today who is an expert. He's working with some of the top marketing people out there and showing them how to make a real big difference. And I wanted him to share his expertise with us. He is, you know, think of all the changes that have gone on with SEO and the need for content, thought leadership. He's gonna show you exactly how each and every one of us can use our website to generate that consistent stream of new right clients. Doesn't that sound great? Well, it is. Uh, Phil uh, Singleton is just an amazing individual and he's joining us, so you don't wanna miss it. I'm John Bowen, I'm founder of AESNation.com and this is all about accelerating your success and making a huge impact together. Stay tuned. Ordinary success? No way. You want amazing, remarkable, exceptional breakthroughs. Dig deep, think bold, drive hard, watch yourself soar beyond your dreams. AESNation.com excited that you're joining us here today and uh, this is an area that everybody has questions about so first of all thank you for joining thank you so much for having me my pleasure you know phil um we have a common friend john uh, jance that you have as a business partner and you've done an awful lot together and you know i've always really respected what he's doing when i saw you guys were working together i got i gotta reach out because this is an area that i have a lot of questions on i've got multiple websites i've got great technology i've got all the market latest marketing automation and everything else a lot of .coms. and you know i'm still frustrated when i go to my mastermind groups i find people are so frustrated and and i'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're seeing some clients coming to you that are frustrated too is that the case it does. You know, it happens a lot. I think this is kind of an eternal um, business, small business, general, general business problem where I think a lot of folks um, trying to figure out hey, if I'm going to invest marketing dollars, how do I do it in a way that I can get the best return on investment? Um, but what we see a lot is, you know, a lot of folks, I think, try things. Everybody wants leads. I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to figure out ways to grow our business. Once we figure out how to deliver a really good service, um, then it's all about getting the right kind of ideal clients in, right? Um, but what ends up happening with a lot of folks that want more leads and sales is they go out and kind of hip shoot it, um, different kinds of tactics, right? And what ends up really needing to happen though is you know having some kind of a cohesive strategy where you kind of you know put all this stuff together in a way that really works for you. So that's well, what we see a lot when folks come to see us is they come with us and they say, hey, we've got some problems. Let's start with our website where the problem is. And, and it's usually one of those um, kind of tactics. Well, and I, and I just, as a matter of fact, I just got off the phone with a fellow entrepreneur and he was sharing all this. and. And it's just like, you know, boy, just kind of the classic throw money at it and not really think through a strategy, put it together. But before we go there, Phil, one of the things I want to do, and I, I didn't tell you about this, I, for, I apologize, but I want you to tell, you know, I know you're, you're a little bit different than the average geek out there, marketing geek. I'll, I'll say. Too. Yeah. <laughs> And you did still your first, a geek in my own way, though. Yeah, no, I'm a little geekish too. So we're, you know, we're, and you know, today's where we all have to have a little geekism in us. But uh, the idea here is, you know, you, you did your first website at 35. So I know a lot of one of the questions I usually ask is, you know, at age five, did you know what you're going to do? Obviously, no. You know, tell us how you got to where you are now, and then. What I'd like to do is go through some of the life lessons that we can share with our fellow entrepreneurs so they can be much more successful as well. Yeah, I love it because I think I'm the poster boy for if he can do it, anybody can do it. Um, I went to school for finance thinking I was going to work on Wall Street. Um, actually, I got a D in computer science in college. I love telling people that because it's like, you know, um, how, how did you go from from a D well, to that, running a, that's, a thriving? That, that's the qualification. Then that, that's what it takes here. <laughs> well, and it's also the, one of these things where you don't want to learn you know, how to lose weight from the guy that's born with, you know, 5% body fat or whatever it is. You want to learn from the guy that's, you know 
walk the walk type of thing. I feel like I really have. But long story short, I went to get graduated. Was lucky to have a job out of school, but I was with an insurance company in a cubicle. Real quickly, I didn't figure. I figured I, that this is not what I want to be uh, when I grow up. Uh, at the end of the third or fourth year there, I was like, I think I probably had some kind of a meltdown. I figured I have got to do something different. I'm going to end up looking like one of these guys that has been in this building here for 20 or 30 years, stuck um, in an industry that they may have not have chosen. I didn't really choose it. It was just the only job that I that was that I had out of school. And I was really actually really happy to have that you know, out of school. But um, long story short there, quit my job, you know, over the course of two or three weeks and and sold all my stuff. And I moved to Asia and I ended up living there for about 10 years. And that's got a bunch of stories and wild rides. Where in there, where in Asia did you end up? I was in Taipei, Taiwan. Okay, okay. A little off the beaten path for a Kansas City boy here. Yeah, I thought maybe China, but at that time, China was still, and it's obviously still developing right well, now, but it's much different than it was 20 years ago. consider that China. <laughs> at least China right. does. But. Right. And so I figured Taiwan's a great place to learn Mandarin, but still maybe have a, more of a kind of a modern. And it worked out really, really well. In fact, my wife's Taiwanese, so I met, I got yes. married two so years So it was very was good. <laughs> right. So the end of that period, what ended up happening is work the dot-com area. Long story short there, software company ended up falling into my lap. Um, based on some of the work that I was doing there. And I kind of took the, the bull by the horns and ended up basically running running a software company. And I learned a lot at that time, really opened my eyes up to the power of the internet and even Google in particular 15, 17 years ago. Um, really from a guy that was, you know, studied business and finance early on, I really could see, wow, um, if you follow the ROI trail for a lot of the digital stuff online back then, a lot of it was being um, controlled or influenced in a big way by Google, right? And in fact, long story short there with the uh, with the software company that I was running really um, was that um, I saw that you know, at this time, going more than 15 years ago, more than half of our sales were coming from affiliate marketers. So you had these guys that were running forums and blogs, clicking on these ads, coming to our website, and then we had to pay affiliate checks out 50, 70, $80,000 a month. So for me, I was like, how is this happening? And it really kind of opened my eyes to Google and SEO and all this kind of stuff. And I figured, oh, it's coming from websites and content and Google. So that, that, at that point in my life, I really kind of figured out, okay, I see, I see where the future is um, and how these companies are making money. So we ended up selling that company. It was a nice payday, but it wasn't a, um, you know, retire and I'll never work again. <laughs> Moved back to the States here in Kansas City um, in about 2005. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I ended up having doing, um, again, I'm going to kind of shrink this up for you, but I ended up doing a barter website in 2005 for an auto detailer um, and didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew that enough about SEO at that time from the software venture that I was, I was running that um, this could be really a really powerful thing for local businesses. So I told this guy, didn't know if I could do it. Um, that I was going to build him a website on barter and, um, you know, because I, th- I told, hey, he, he, at this time he was he was selling auto um, detail jobs to dealerships for like twenty five dollars a car, like killing himself. And I thought, well, if you could get directly to the consumer, you might be able to sell them for one hundred or two hundred dollars a car. So I ended up making him a website. It was a very painful process for me because, um, you know, I didn't know anything about web design. So I tried really hard and something called Dreamweaver failed at that. Ended up finding something called Microsoft front page. Ended up building the ugliest little one page purple and yellow uh, website you've ever seen. But lo and behold, about 60 days later, he calls me up, the owner of this business that I bartered with and says, Phil, I don't know what you've done. You've changed my business, you've changed my life um, because the phone's ringing like it never has before. And at that point I was like, wow, 35 years old, <laughs> I finally know what I wanna be when I grow up, right? Um, Cause that was the most professionally rewarding thing that really had ever happened to me. And secondly, I was like, I think I can make some money off of this, right? So that's really what put me on the path to where I was uh, today, yeah, was that one pushing, pushing the envelope a little bit and then boom, you know, something that could great happen. Well, and it, and it is that. I mean, you know, one of the things that we all see is the, as entrepreneurs is the more we can create value for someone else, we do well. I mean, it's the enlightened self-interest that makes that happen. And I want to go over uh, lessons. You know, we were talking about lessons before we turned on the recorder. And one, you really kind of set the stage well with the story is, you know, nothing good ever happens unless you push the envelope. You've got to, you got to really deliver value and you got to do something that you're uncomfortable with. And, you know, that's, you know, you weren't the expert, but you went out and did it and made a huge difference in uh, your first client's uh, life. 
Yeah, and for me, yeah, a, a big, big problem, problem that I have, I think out of school, it's not one of these things, I don't know if it was just me or everybody's like this, but I felt really confident in myself in um, high school and college. And then when I got out of school, I, I just had this rude awakening. All of a sudden I lost all my confidence and I had a lot of anxiety. It was really hard for me to you know, talk to people and stuff. So, so what I found though was a couple, a couple things that happened, but I think in particular, making that huge life change and moving to Asia and able to thrive in another culture, learn another language and actually run a business. And it really enabled me to get the kind of confidence where I felt like I could handle anything that was thrown at me. So that was one of the things I think that also just helped me grow up um, was that first really dramatic you know, thing that I think changed probably the whole trajectory of my career, I guess my life in, in retrospect. Um, and, and no looking back there. And then again, once I learned on that piece of it, I was like, okay, here's a guy that has a problem. I think I know enough, at least I'm part of this to really solve his problem. And I think at that time also, I figured, you know, I could really fall on my face on this, but I've seen what's happened when I push the envelope. I think I'm really confident I could do this. I also thought, you know what, in the back of my mind, if I really fail this guy, I'm going to reach into my pocket and I hire somebody else to do it. But, um, but yeah, I think that part of that thing is, is, is pushing yourself outside and um, taking that chance um, is good things happen, one, but it also can be a huge confidence booster. It, it really is. I mean, I've had the same experience. I've started a lot of businesses where I first go ahead and you know, kind of launch the business. Uh, you know, software, it's called Vaporware, but I've done it in services and then you know, let the market tell us what they want and just really deliver the results and go way overboard but at the same time, by doing that, you know, one of the things that you get is you get confidence. You know, none of it, all of us are a little insecure. And then by going out and, you know, everybody thinks you start with confidence. You don't start with confidence. You, you start with courage <laughs> to go out and do something. Uh, I like uh, Dan Sullivan has a uh, strategic coach. Has a, I think it's uh, you start with courage. You then find the capability. Sometimes we have to outsource the stuff. Then as you do that, you get the... You, know, you really get the competency because you, you learn what works and that gives you the confidence. And this is that never ending circle. And it's just really powerful. Let me go though. One of the things you've done and you, you know, we're forced to in this industry. Well, and we got security coming after us now here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in California though, so I don't think it's a long drive. But uh, the, you know, the thought, Phil, is that, you know, there's so many changes going on that, you know, Google and Facebook, the technology side, you know, the importance of pivoting. I'm in Silicon Valley. This is, I think it's one of the favorite words here is pivot because mm -hmm. so often, you know, somebody's venture backed and they go out with tons of money to do something. And they go, oh, shoot, it doesn't work. <laughs> and, you know, we could give the money back or we pivot, we pivot. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts on pivoting? I think, you know, just, just to kind of, you know, put it in perspective of where, where I am, it's almost like with SEO and with Google and the way they're constantly um, trying to battle folks that are trying to manipulate results um, to get, you know, the rankings and visibility and the clicks and sales um, is that they're constantly, <laughs> I mean, they're constantly changing things. They're constantly trying to do, find out better ways to rank better websites to make sure that they maintain that quality so that they can continue to be the 600, 700 billion you know, dollar company that they are. That means for me is that, you know, I've had to pivot several times as they've um, had to had make updates to their algorithms to um, make sure that, um, you know, that, that they can maintain those results. And, and some of these have been really, really game changing types of updates that they've made um, to the way that they rank websites. Because it used to be we we're talking about before the show, John, was that um, and one of the things that drew me to, to SEO in the first place was I'm kind of an introvert you know, by nature. And one of the great things about search engine optimization in the early days was you could get a client and almost never have to talk to them because you could do things kind of in the back office on the website or with third party link build, building and drive you know, a bunch of backlinks to a website. And that moved the needle for a long, long time. And, um, and it was great because, um, because you could sit back, get clients and, and really not have to do much. But you know, what ended up happening over the years is, you know, people started to manipulate the system more and more and toward almost became mainstream. And you had even large companies trying to game, game the system with links and kind of on page um, antics from JC Penney, eBay, overstock.com. A lot of these companies got called out for, for trying to game the system too hard. Well, long story short there is Google kind of came back six, seven years ago 
and really started to make the algorithm more punitive in nature and trying to look after the way people were trying to manipulate the rankings. Well, what that means in terms of me having to pivot was um, they talked about content being king for a long time, but we in SEO snickered for years because we knew on page SEO and links, and it was what really kind of moved the needle. But then when they made these major algorithmic changes about six, seven years ago, they really meant it this time. And what ended up happening was they put a lot more em emphasis on, on quality and content um, and reputation, a lot more signals than just heavily weighting those, those two or three things that they used to really heavily weight in the past. Well, that for me, that really meant what? An intro the introverted guy that didn't even have a blog on his website, now I blog all the time. Now I'm writing books. Now I'm on podcasts. Now I have my own podcast, right? I'm out there trying to develop personal branding and authority and all these things that Google's trying to do with their algorithm and with their artificial intelligence to try and gather up all these signals to try and figure out, hey, this is quality content. Let's rank this guy and serve up you know, his answers and his content and to questions when people are doing voice search or traditional internet search and all that kind of stuff. So huge pivots in there to have to actually change the way, you know, your approach to actually delivering services. Um, and, and that's a great example of how kind of Google keeps us on our toes and essentially is making us do like micro pivots all the time. Well, let's let's go to that. I want to go a little bit, you know, because one of the things that you do is you walk your talk. I mean, so, I, you know, a lot of uh, I'll talk with somebody that does something. Let's use a web uh, developer. And, you know, the first thing they'll say to me is, John, don't look at my website. I've been too busy helping other people. And then I go, well, you know, what clients? Well, really, I don't, there's none that are exactly the way I want to use as a demo <laughs> Yeah, And, you know, the, the key thing to me is you've got to walk your talk. I mean, this is so important to be able to walk your talk. And you do. And the part that I want you to spend some time on, Phil, because this is a pretty major shift that we're, we just kind of touched on. Because when I came in, you know, in the SEO side, I, you know, I got all excited on the back link. I just came in right at the tail end before it switched. And by the time I figured out what I needed to do, it was too late. But, you know, you, you find these things and you try to figure out, oh, I'm going to game the system. and It's going to work so well. Shortcuts all over the place, right? <laughs> yeah, all over the place. It's going to be, you know, it's done and it's not. And, and one of the things I, I really like now, I mean, I think, you know, Google is a smart company, obviously very successful uh, you know, all but a monopoly uh, by the FTC's <laughs> requirement. And what we, you know, with that, they write the rules and they're getting really smart on people gaming the system. You know, so one of the things you have to actually have value. And I want to, you know, this is something not all of us as entrepreneurs understand. And even if we understand, we don't know how to apply it. I mean, how, how do you help your fellow entrepreneurs, you know, your clients really, you know, think through this because it's, you know, you, you think of the pivot, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't like being spokesmen. So they don't want to be on podcasts. They don't right. want to write, you know, books and columns and all this well, stuff. You're and, looking at one of them. Yeah. <laughs> See, actually, I, I, I do. I, got, I think I've written right about... Just because I'm an introvert, you know, it's just the way I'm wired. So, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I like I writing, fans. but, but mm -hmm. you know, but and everybody's everywhere. So how, how, how do they address it, Phil? Well, there's a couple things. And one of the things that you mentioned is one of the ways I sell is, again, I don't think I'm the type of guy that can sell an ice cube to an Eskimo type of deal. So what's worked for me over the years is literally my presentation is, okay, somebody comes in, let me show you what we're going to do for you. Do a search for Kansas City Web Design. We come up first. We've got more reviews than anybody else. Come to the website. And then we try and show you all the things on the website that you need um, to convert somebody and warm them up and get the phone call on the sale. So being able to do that when somebody's like in your office or in, in you know, in an interview, it's very powerful because it's like, that's the system that I want to build for you. Let's talk about how, the, how we've done that. So I do, I do think that's really powerful for a lot of, it doesn't matter if it's web design or anything. If, if you can show people that whatever you're trying to sell them works for something that you're doing as your own case study, very, very powerful stuff. Now let's take one step back though and talk about one of my favorite hacks again is the way I like to try and convince people is to show them evidence, okay? So one of the coolest things about Google is, and I totally agree with what you said, John, Google is like one of the most powerful monopolies that's ever been on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually, I think, part of the modern purchase process. And people don't really understand, I think, how important it is that the short amount of time people you know, spend on Google versus what they spend on social media. But it touch on it. that because I don't think everybody gets that. That's really important because, you know, in the, I want to call it the old days. 
you know, where we, you know, I've had many businesses along the way and we would sell, we'd have the opportunity to have the early conversation and we're helping the person do the research and then we can do the sale. That's, you know, Google's changed that totally. It's almost like what high ticket purchase is there that ha doesn't have some type of a Google search along the way. Um, in fact, I don't shop that much offline anymore. I do a lot on Amazon. Um, which is another great monopoly that we've got. <laughs> um, but literally, if you go to like a Best Buy store or, or try and buy something anywhere, you'll see people like Googling stuff right in front of them on the shelf, you know? Um, and I just saw that like a couple of weeks ago. I was walking around, people were you know, searching for stuff while they're actually in the store. Uh, but I do believe that for most people, um, Google sort of big ticket items, it's Googling is just part of the modern purchase process. I mean, there's five to six billion internet searches a day, it boils down to about 70,000 searches a second. Um, and it's mostly people looking for answers to questions and information about products and services. And anybody who wants to make a decision, I mean, they're basically going to Google something on somebody. And even the whole, ref to me, even the whole referral word of mouth games changed because, you know, back in the day when I bought my first house, I would have asked my dad for a referral on whatever home services I want to do. Well, if somebody, that's great. If I hear a ref referral on social media now, or my dad tells me there's a, there's a good person I should try, the first thing I'm going to do is look them up online to see if <laughs> that word of mouth referral, it actually matches up to what I can find on my own, um, what I see on their website or what, what kind of social group that they well, stacked up. Yeah, and that's why I want you to, and I, that's true. I mean, you know, I, I do that like everybody else, but my wife has gone through, uh, you know, some fairly serious health issues and I've got all kinds of access to connections because what we do, but the, uh, I still, you know, I get strong referrals from a, a high-end concierge group that's sending me, say, hey, these are the people you would need to meet with, hop on a plane, go meet with these guys, we'll set it up. I go on their website and look at their website to see, you know, one of the things, I'm a lay person in the case of medical, I don't know whether they're an expert or not, but I'm looking at their publishing their thought leadership, how they're held, you know, the other conferences, you know, and as you called social proof. And, and we do this in every part, anything important in life. I, I saw a study from Harvard that it was, it's not, we, we might be overstating it was, they came up with 98.9% .9 of the people on important decisions, Google it. I don't know what the other, you know, that little piece isn't doing, but this is amazing. But how do you, how do you help, you know, fellow entrepreneurs actually, you know, it's one thing to have a website, but have the content there that gives them the credibility that if you or I are shopping for their services, we say, hey, I, w I want this person. So my favorite thing to do is like, if I just say that and it's like, okay, I've done this stuff, I've written a book, you found me, it's still, um, it's still not coming from the horse's mouth. So one of my favorite tools and hacks, I think that's out there that's actually freely available. And I think it's almost like one of these deals where when I first read it, I was like, oh my gosh, I have the answers to the test type of a thing. I shouldn't be looking at this. Is Google has an army of about 10 to 15,000 human beings that they use to manually check search results. So they've got all this great technology and the whole system's based on them able to use algorithms and artificial intelligence to go out there and scour the internet and find the best information and serve it up too. But they also have a human team to go out and say, let's make sure um, that the stuff that we're searching actually makes sense to humans. They've got this kind of a human feedback and they call that the Google search quality evaluators. Um, and they've had this for years, but about two years ago, um, they actually released the document that they use to train these independent contractors. And it's called the Google Search Quality Evaluator Guidelines, okay? You have to keep in mind that people that they use to hire to manually check the quality of search results, they're, they're not, not like trying to go out and find like rocket science. They're just regular lay people that are looking for extra work um, on a part-time or full-time basis. So the guidelines are written for people to understand. Now they're about, right now they're about 160 pages, but if you literally like right now, if you go and Google, Google, search quality evaluator guidelines, I think that's five words, right? You will find the first search result is goes directly to Google to the PDF link where you can download this document for free. Now it's absolutely fascinating to me because you read the first two um, pages of the document are um, just the table of contents and they basically are breaking down what they're telling these first time quality evaluators what to look for on a website in order to determine if it's a quality website or a quality web page. So it gets really specific. And in fact, there is an abbreviation in there they use 
dozens of times, maybe scores of times, called EAT. And it's in there from the very beginning throughout, at least to the middle of the book, I think all the way to the end. And they talk about EAT, EAT, EAT. And EAT is expertise, authority, and trust. So these are the three elements that they try to hammer into the search quality evaluators to look for on a website. And they go into great detail to say, well, what are, I mean, it's great to say, hey, we need to see expertise and authority and trust, but what does that really mean, right? Well, they get down into the elements of the page that you need to see. And you'll actually see this on my website because the first time they released this, I went right to work and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to actually redesign my site now based on- Well, you're, you're getting the cookbook formula. I, you know, exactly. I, I wrote this down. I didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, that's a very powerful thing to think through at least as initial framing. And what's the element? The element is they want to see a phone number. They want to see an address. They want to see testimonials. They want to see um, certifications and badges. They talk a lot about MC and SC, which is um, a satisfactory amount of main content and supplementary content. Um, I mentioned badges, association badges. They want to see um, testimonials, reviews, um, all these things that actually provide more trust and proof on your website. They also want to see, and they go very specifically, they say they want to know who is the author of the content on the website. Um, so there's all sorts, and there's like 20 or 30 other examples in, in this document where they go in and say very specifically the types of things you need to bake into your website to increase you know the, the expertise, authority, and trust. And it's doing two things. One, it's telling you what Google um, wants to see to rank your website, but Google's really smart. They've been doing this for a lot of years. They know when a visitor visits onto the website, the stuff that they need to show them in order to convince people to buy things because their whole business, 90% of their revenues come from AdWords, right? And that's driving people from the paid clicks, which only really represents about 20% of the total traffic. Organic's about 80% of it. But the idea is that you pay them for money, which is how they make their you know billions of dollars to come onto your web page. They wanna make sure that people actually see information on the website and the web page that convinces them to take action and make a sale. Because when that happens, people invest more money into AdWords, right? They don't say this in the document, but to me, that's really what the, the um, what, um, the important message of, of this document is, is they're really trying to, you know, make sure that you have the right elements on the web to, page to be successful. Um, and it's, you know, there's that surface level thing where they're trying to, to teach the uh, quality evaluators, but there's also the, the fact that, you know, Google, if Google's going to put out a 160 page document, you know, every major engineer of a lot, they really poured over every single word on it. They've updated it several times. I'll probably update it again this year. Um, but there's, there's, um, there's a lot of intention behind that document and a lot of, of answers to things. So when I come out and say, you need to have this on the website, that's one thing, right? For me coming as an agency owner, but when I can pull out a document to say, look, Google says you need to have this stuff on your website, um, then it carries a lot more weight. Well, you know, one of the things, Phil, um, you and I uh, are really, we're kind of into this stuff because uh, I, in the way I'm, you, you do it as a business, I do it for my businesses. And it's so important to me because it generates that steady stream of new clients. And, you know, it's, it's amazing when you do it right. <laughs> and I've done it both ways and I prefer right. But one of the things that I've always struggled with, and I know you hear from other entrepreneurs is, geez, when you start looking at all this content, you know, how do you do it? And, and one of the things you talk about in your writing and you know, conversations is repurposing. Why don't you talk about repurposing? Because you know, I, I know when I, I went to my first kind of uh, presentation, you know, teaching you how to do all this stuff, I go, you know what? I'm going to try another business because this is <laughs> this is a lot of work. It really is, and but the one of the things I really love about it is is I think one of the things that drew me to like SEO in particular in the beginning was the ability to kind of do a few things and jump up quickly with shortcuts that you could use in the past that actually work. So the reason I say that is because still I think the heart of what I always try and do is how can I do the least amount of work and get the most amount of value out of it. So trying to find those hacks is really kind of what drives me um, to this day. And uh, just to give an example, because there's a lot of things we talked about, John, even before the show, I think a lot of people, they throw money at stuff, stuff or they, they spin their wheels and somebody says, hey, blogging works. They go out and do a bunch of blogs, they go a bunch of stuff, but there's a lot of times there's not, 
if you do things kind of in a one dimensional way, you end up spinning your wheels, wasting a lot of time, wasting a lot of money. Well, I, um, I think of, I saw a piece on the number of podcasts, since we're both doing podcasts, the average podcast is like two and a half or something like that. You know, that they try it and it, and it doesn't work in their mind. And, you know, and, and I think I'm at probably about 220 right now. And, you know, it just, it, it takes, you have to be a little bit resilient as we were talking about. But t bring this together for us. Okay. okay, so one of my favorite hacks would be like this. So um, blogging to me is still really one of the most important parts of, of marketing and, and building a website. And the reason being is because Google wants to rank web pages. They don't want to rank social media posts or other stuff. They want, and that's the one asset that you have that you can grow, and it's yours, and it's not on somebody else's property type of thing. So, if I sell you on the point that blogging is really important because it establishes your authority, Google actually basically says this in the search quality. They don't call it blogging, but they look for um, authoritative content on the website, right? So, what they really mean to me is you're going to be adding new information and educational information on your website. Well, it does a couple of things, right? You're blogging, you're blogging on a consistent basis, you're growing your pages out. You can blog about things that are, people are searching for. If you take the extra time to do some keyword research to know what your ideal clients are searching for. So this is kind of where, how our process works is you want to do keyword research. I think you have to do keyword research because you, you can't, can't really ever really know who your ideal client is to me fully, unless you know how they search for products and services or words around your business. Once you do that and have that information, it's awesome because now you know how to structure your website and now you know what types of blogs to write, even maybe what to talk about on certain podcasts and things like that. Um, but when we do a blog post, for me, we never do them just in single blog posts anymore, even based off just the keywords. What we try and do is we do them in blog series. So you wanna do a series of 10 or 15 point, uh, blog posts in a series of posts um, that could then be published individually a standalone blog post, but at the end can be stitched together into an ebook that then you could then use as a call to action on your website, right? Which is great. This is a very common, you know, uh, inbound marketing tactic that's been used for a long time. Um, but you can't do that if you just do 10 independent blog posts and post them. You can't stitch together 10 posts that have been on, on random different topics and then try and create an ebook out of it. But if you do this stitching together into an ebook, then you can then take that ebook and then turn it into a Kindle and get someone to help you publish it up on Amazon. Well, that changes the game a little bit because now the client or you, you're now a published author, you're up on Amazon, you're able to reach a new audience. You've also got like a, um, an author page up in there which has got its own little SEO value because you can pull your, your, your RSS blog feed from your blog up onto your website and get some very powerful backlinks. Not back. That's kind of a side thing. It's not a silver bullet, but it is a nice thing. Then you can then take that same book, now you're an author and use it as a way to it's basically you have a publishable, uh, you know, kind of a launchable piece of content that you could do things like what I ended up doing, which is um, using it as a podcast guesting campaign, right? So we can get up and say, now I'm a published author, author. Here's my one sheet, which is almost kind of like a bio. You can go out and, and, and pitch yourself um, to, to podcast hosts. And all of a sudden, now you're able to multiply, build your personal branding and authority. And, and what's great about podcast guesting is it's almost like a, a, a town hall, kind of a virtual um, speaking tour, we are getting out in front of pockets of who knows, maybe it's 50 people somebody has, maybe it's 500, maybe it's 50,000, um, but it sure is an easy way to get out in front of lots of people and establish yourself and get access to new audiences. And also there's tons of benefits you do. So I'm gonna bring it back and how that's a way that you basically, if you got the right keyword and content strategy, and maybe you hire some writers to help you start writing this blog series and post up on your website, now you're basically almost doing your blogging and writing a book in the background or in your sleep, so to speak, while you're still running your business. And that's kind of the types of hacks you wanna do. Because if you just look at each one of these individually, like um, I'm gonna do the SEO, I'm gonna write blog posts, I'm gonna write a book down the line, maybe I'll do something related to podcasting individually. You never get that um, single kind of an effort where you can get spend a lot less time and money and get a lot more results out of it. No, this, this is really good. And I think this is so important. I just wanna reiterate it a bit. I always think of it as repurposing. And we do very much what you're talking about. And you know we do a huge amount of content because we have a thought leadership program we do for financial advisors and another one for entrepreneurs uh but it's it is we, we put out a lot of content 
and everything is repurposed. Um, and we have a whole systematic way of doing it because there's no way you can create all of this. I mean, most of us feel overwhelmed when you create the systems. And one of the things I want to, a big distinction I have, Phil, is there's authors and writers. And so many people like myself, entrepreneurs, I mean, my, <laughs> my former English teachers would be amazed. I've published now, I think, 24 books. Uh, awesome. my, my partner's published now 60. And it's just... You know, the first book took two years, uh, the last one 30 days. Uh, <laughs> yes. I am the co-author in a case with my partner, Russ Allen Prince, and, but we have a team of writers, editors, research people, the whole thing. And sometimes we get caught up, we think we have to do it, but if we can, if you've got the ideas, you can have work with teams like yours and really pull this all together. And it's pretty amazing. Matter of fact, let me do this. What I'd like to do, I'm gonna pull up on the other screen your website and bring it up. Uh, tell us, you know, you know, I see it's coming up, you know, that you sell websites, you build lead generation websites, all this stuff. Um, you know, it's kind of like, okay, this is what I want. I mean, how does somebody, you know, working with you in any of these capacities, um, one, I'm assuming you go outside of Kansas City or we wouldn't be talking, Phil. <laughs> so, but, you know, what, what is it that, um, how would you help an entrepreneur best and what are the resources on your website for them? Well, it's really interesting that, um, you know, I've been, I started off here locally and we do really well. I think we basically dominate the market in terms of our footprint, you know, online when you search for stuff. And then all of a sudden, I really started to buy into personal branding and authority building and it's really ballooned for me in the last like uh, 12 or, or 18 months so it's just a power to the uh, it's just a testament to the power of doing this kind of content marketing where i've almost kind of fallen behind being able to capitalize on opportunities because for so long i marketed myself as kansas city web design but now through the power of podcasting content marketing writing books and stuff I'm getting my audience is extending way outside of Kansas City. I'm driving them back to a, web, a website that's still um, as largely you know based on the geography that I'm in right now. So there's a whole process of me right now, also trying to you know create another kind of a separate brand that's more less tied to Kansas City. Um, but yeah, essentially it would be offering the same types of services, and that is a lot of what you see on the website right now. Um, and that is when I told you about the Google Search Quality Evaluator guidelines and the things that you need to see on a website to get it to rank and have people convert when it gets there. If you talk about expertise, authority, and trust, I think as you scroll down my website, you'll see a lot of the things that I talked about because I basically am looking at this in terms of a potential visitor, a potential client, but also a Google search quality evaluator. Are they seeing those things that I, we know make people feel comfortable in order to get them to know, like, and trust you and, and, and figure if you're an, an expert in your space? And you'll see that as you scroll down. There's my book. There's third party um, influencers that say we do great work. Um, there's other things that we've done, you know, offline to show folks that um, you're basically providing the evidence that you can deliver um, on some of this stuff. And that's the type of things, the same system, that system that I built for myself that works for us in terms of getting ideal clients is, is exactly the same thing that we try and do. It doesn't look the same for everybody, um, but the system works. And that is build your website, make it a marketing platform, Make it a place where you're going to publish content. Don't put your best content up on other platforms directly. Put it on your website. Publish it out. Make people come back and get them into your 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 funnel, your education cycle. A place where, where you can, can tag them with AdWords remarketing, tag them with the Facebook pixel, and it's yours. You know that's the kind of system that really works. And the more you invest in content in your website, the more it grows, the more SEO equity it builds and when you tie everything back. So the, again, getting back to the beginning part of the conversation is we're talking about people that are kind of tactically doing stuff. Well, mm -hmm. if you build, make your website the hub and the referral source for content that you're continually growing, everything kind of comes back to it and that's where the magic happens. It's the same stuff that we I do for myself and that's kind of the same kind of systems that we do for, for clients, whether in Kansas City or in other parts of the country. No, this is great and let me, I. Yeah, we need to wrap it up, so I'm going to put it, uh, my key takeaways, and Phil really you know, did a super job of summarizing, but I'm going to just go back to the acronym, uh, you know, EAT. I, I hadn't heard that before, and I will be pulling that up. We'll put a link in the show notes as well for that, but, you know, expert. Today, everybody has, yeah, it's so easy. The Internet's a perfect facilitator. 
if you're affluent, your best client, they've got choices. They want to work with the best. And if you're not positioned as the expert, they're not going to work with you other than a you know, $35 transaction type thing. Authority. I mean, it's just, you know, they, we want to work with the expert who has authority and it's demonstrable and that they have trust. And, you know, one of the most powerful things is testimonials, influencers, as Phil was saying. This is really powerful. Phil, this has been great. I appreciate it very much. And, uh, you know, again, everything will be AESNation.com. We'll have the links to what Phil discussed. Transcript uh, will be there as well as the show notes. And with that, uh, go out, your clients, and all those future clients that Phil's helping us get, they're counting on you to execute. Go execute. We wish you the best of success. Thanks, John. Exceptional, remarkable breakthroughs. AESNation.com.